Welcome everyone to the second edition of the Missing Lecture Series of Insaf India. I am Lotika Singha here with Shruti Bala. We are both from Insaf India, which stands for International Solidarity for Academic Freedom in India. And we are a diverse group of diasporic Indians located in different parts of the world, currently mainly Europe and North America. Some of us are academics, some are professionals in various fields when we all share a deep concern about the increasing assaults on academic freedom in India, in particular, the attacks on anti-caste academics and scholars from minority backgrounds. We consider it our obligation to raise our voices, to direct international attention, not only to what is happening in India in terms of the infringements on academic freedom, but also to the growing dissemination of anti-intellectual regressive political thought in the name of Indian culture and history, at educational and research institutions within India and around the world. We also believe that academic freedom is inextricably linked to social justice and that knowledge production and formation is bound to the fostering of our social selves. So this uh, lecture today is part of what we are calling the miss missing lecture series. Uh, we host this series as a part of our refusal of the silencing of academic voices, and in response to the blatant authoritarian suppression of discussion and exchange of ideas in Indian universities. Uh, we started this series when we noticed that talks and seminars were being canceled at universities and colleges across the country for their supposedly anti-national or obje objectionable content. And we felt it's important to offer a platform for these critical voices. Um, the first lecture we hosted in the series was by Professor Deepa Kumar from Rutgers University, who gave a talk titled Islamophobia is Anti-Muslim Racism. And this talk was originally meant to be hosted at Manipal Association of Higher Education. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Atharzia for the second lecture in the series, and also honored to welcome Dr. Mohammed Junaid, Assistant Professor of Anthropology, Massachusetts College of the Liberal Arts, who will introduce Dr. Zia and moderate the session. Uh, so thanks to both of you, Athar and Junaid, for joining us. And uh, thanks to everyone who's uh, also attending this session. Uh, your participation is an act of solidarity for academic freedom in India. Over to you, Junaid. Uh, thank you so much. Um... Uh, I would like to first of all thank uh, INSAF India for um, organizing this uh, lecture um, and I would in a minute uh, introduce uh, my dear friend Dr. Athar Zia. Um, as um, was mentioned, uh, this is part of the Missing Lecture series. Um, the original event was supposed to happen last fall uh, in um, at JNU um, and it was organized by the Center for Women's Studies. Um, the lecture was canceled at the last moment uh, because the administration of that university of, at Jawaharlal Nehru University um, claimed that the, the, the content of Dr. Zia's lecture was objectionable and provocative. Of course, Dr. Zia had not uh, shared um, that content with the JNU administration, they were uh, probably uh, uh, worried about some of the words that were in the title. Um, and um, I mean, Dr. Zia would mention a little bit about um, that. Um, my sense is that JNU, with which I have had some previous association, and it used to be a progressive space where there were um, a significant number of, um, you know, people who did not necessarily, uh, who were not in consonance with the internationalist perspective would find space. Um, but over the last several years, um, um, we have found that univers the university itself has become uh, a site of suppression of alternative voices uh, where, you know, uh, and students there have been denied access to um, uh, knowledge of, um, you know, speech that would give them a perspective different from what the Indian state wants um, them to know. Um, so um, I feel sorry for the students at JNU and for the Center for Women's Studies 
to have missed a brilliant lecture by Dr. Arthur Sia. Um, on that note, I want to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Zia. Uh, as uh, perhaps some of you know, uh, Dr. Arthur Zia is a very well-known uh, name um, in the field of anthropology. She's a prolific writer and, um, and has been a prominent intellectual from Kashmir, um, um, whose voice is uh, clear and you know, strident and um, uh, always um, speaks for the justice of, of justice uh, for the people of Kashmir. Um, she is an associate professor of anthropology at um, University of Northern Colorado, Greeley. Um, she has written um, several books in, in, and or been a co-editor of several books. Uh, her uh, 2019 book, uh, Resisting Disappearances, uh, A Military Occupation and Women's Activism in Kashmir, won several awards and recognitions, uh, including the 2020 Gloria Anzaldua um, Honorable Mention Award, 2020, 2021 Public Anthropologist Award, uh, Advocate of the Year Award 2021 and um, 2021 uh, Rosaldo Book Prize Honorable Mention. Um, she has co-edited um, several volumes, including Can You Hear uh, Kashmiri Women Speak, um, which was published in 2020. Uh, she has also co-edited uh, Resisting Occupation in Kashmir, um, 2018, and um, a Desolation Called Peace, um, published in 2019. Uther um, is also a very well-known poet. Um, her ethnographic poetry on Kashmir has won several uh, recognitions and awards, including one from Society for Humanistic Anthropology. She is also an editor of Kashmir Lit, an online magazine which has been um, an amazing space for Kashmiri writers and poets. Um, um, and who principally write in English, but also who translate Kashmiri writings into English. Uh, Athar is also part of the Critical Kashmir Study uh, Studies, um, which is a collective and interdisciplinary group of people who work on Kashmir. Um, and um, as a fellow uh, Critical Kashmir Studies collective member, um, this is a space that has uh, created a new awareness in both um, uh, scholarly settings, but also in, among general public about what has been happening in Kashmir and how to understand Kashmir. So uh, Dr. Zia is going to be speaking today about gendered resistance and uh, fresh challenges in a post-2019 Kashmir. Um, uh, for some of you who may not know, uh, 2019 has become an important date in recent Kashmiri memory, and uh, Dr. Zia is going to talk about that. Um, She'll speak for 15, 20 minutes, and um, she'll be followed by um, sort of a, a moderated question and answer session with me. Um, I'll ask her a few questions. Uh, that will last probably 15 to 20 minutes. Um, the audience uh, Q&A will last another 20, 20 minutes um, or more based on the number of questions we get. Uh, as has been stated in the chat, you can post your questions in the Q&A. So on to Dr. Zia. Thank you so much, <clears throat> everyone. Uh, thank you, Insaf, uh, Lotika, Shruti, Divya. Thank you for inviting me and uh, making sure that this lecture does not get lost. And thank you, Junaid, uh, for joining this conversation and then <laughs> reading that long bio <laughs> that you had to. Um, it's, a, it's a happy thing that we're talking uh, about something that's very important. And also, you mentioned critical Kashmir studies, uh, not just the collective, which is a group of people, but the sub-discipline, the critical Kashmir studies. I think that's something we need to pay attention to and maybe start from that very uh, moment onwards as to why there is so much resistance to you know, almost harmless academics. Uh, <laughs> if you kind of like look at us here in the US, we don't even count. Uh, but then why is it that there's so much resistance to what we say? And I think that's something where we wanna start. The, lecture which was to be taken uh, to have taken place in fall at JNU uh, at the Women's Studies Department was titled Gendered Resistance and Fresh Challenges in a Post-2019 Kashmir. And the abstract had a, uh, had a word about occupation, the occupation of Kashmir. And as academic uh, scenarios go, you know, you, you 
you project and reflect all kinds of opinions. And uh, I don't mean to say the women's studies department there uh, believes in what I say. This is just an opinion, another academic coming in and presenting their views. Uh, so they publish the abstract or maybe just the two lines as it is on the brochure and that kind of let loose the tirade against the women's studies department and then the VC stepped in and there were protests as well. I didn't really follow it a lot because, you know, people are busy here as well. Your night is our day so we do, and your day is our night. So we don't really uh, see things in real time. But there was a lot of resistance. And finally, uh, we just decided that it's not the way to go if it's creating so many problems for everyone. So it was anyway shut down and we amicably uh, did not want to go ahead with it. But then when INSAF stepped in, I was really happy to have this conversation and know that there are people uh, who are still thinking about these voices and especially when we think about Kashmir. And a post-2019 Kashmir is very important for us to understand uh, because I think it's very important also to understand what's happening largely in India at this moment. But before I begin, I also want to think about, I also want to lay a few things um, just, just for, as a foundation. When Kashmiris are speaking about violence against Kashmiris uh, and all Kashmiris, we are, I'm essentially talking about the Indian state and not within the uh, constitution of the Indian state, but Kashmiris as in resistance to the constitution that has been imposed on them. And when we think about, um, when we think about uh, the, the Indian Muslims, they are actually within uh, the uh, constitution of India and they're fighting within their, uh, for their rights within that. So that's, uh, that's the collation that we don't want when we think about the present day India and what's happening against Muslims, even though the rubric is anti-Islam. Uh, I, I don't really see the word uh, Islamophobia working for most people. Uh, so anti-Islam is what probably it, it kind of uh, fits. So just to go back to thinking about the, uh, or talking about the talk that was to take place, as Junaid mentioned, 2019 is a watershed mark in Kashmir's history because what we like to see it as and define it as that it is a re-annexation of Kashmir after October 27, 1947. So when we talk like this, uh, there is a lot of resistance, not just from uh, Indians who uh, think Kashmir is an integral part, but there is also resistance from those people who give solidarity. And when they think about there is a lot of human rights violations uh, because they don't think uh, that there is an occupation in Kashmir, especially the Indian military occupation. They don't like to see it as such. So it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot of uh, psychic and physical and intellectual travel that people have to do. And uh, I see why that is so. And what Junad and I belong to, uh, we are, as, we, as, as Junad said, that this is a critical Kashmir studies collective kind of a situation here. We belong to that same group. But at the same time, we are also those uh, people, there's a huge group of people. And at some point, people who are in the audience might want to um, look at their work and we can give the names as well and the syllabi that have been formed and people who have contributed to the sub-discipline of critical Kashmir studies, which was founded in the last 15 years and which is kind of recognized in uh, anthropological uh, circles and also the US academia and global academia, I would like to be believe so. And the reason is that we are part of a corrective amplifier generation. Uh, not that our older generation has not spoken about the true history that Kashmiris uh, see from their vantage, uh, but that was really invisibilized in the hegemonic Indian narrative uh, that has been really predominant in the last 72 years. And what Junaid and I speak about, it's not just me, this is one lecture and the focus is on the lecture, but what Junaid ta talks about, what Mona Bhan talks about, what Hafsa Kanjwal talks about, what Huma Dar talks about, uh, these are all the people who are involved in this. And I forget some of the most important names because uh, they, they're not just coming to me, it's, I'm aging as well. Um, uh, but all of them are important. Uh, uh, they are part of the critical Kashmir studies <clears throat> and they are these corrective amplifiers, what they're doing. And that's how I like to see us. We're not saying anything new. What we are writing, what we are thinking is probably English more suited to how the world is ready to receive it. Maybe that's the kind of the little bit of power this generation has. 
but it has been written time and again in Kashmir from 1947 about what Kashmiris see in India. What is the relationship with India? And uh, there is also a collaborator generation and there is also a collaborator section which were pro-India. And again, they were staunch nationalists. They were Kashmiris and they did not want to uh, accede to India completely. Uh, they wanted to work with India, so to speak. And even within uh, a couple of years after doing that, they regretted their decision uh, from 1947 to 1953. They regretted their decision because they were put in jails after that. And they knew that complete annihilation of the Kashmiri identity was what India was demanding, uh, even at that time. So for Kashmiris, when we think about secular India and the India headed by BJP, a fascist Hindu supremacist government, for Kashmiris, it doesn't make much difference except that the degrees in which the oppression or with which the oppression has been imposed on Kashmiris, that, that's kind of different. It's very spectacular in this moment than what has been done in the past, which again was not uh, less brutal, but it wasn't as brazen as it is now because there is no apology for uh, killing Kashmiris or there is no apology because it's seen as the demonization of Kashmiris is complete. Um, again, uh, this is the moment, I don't know if you're going to talk about that or if that arises, uh, but in this moment, uh, I feel like the media, the, the cinema, the Bollywood, everything, everyone is kind of coming together to fully demonize Kashmiri Muslims, so to speak, and uh, create, uh, uh, create foundations to further and highlight the population. So, so the, going back to 2019, what that, why that is important, uh, is because the autonomy of Kashmir, which was a quasi-autonomy, and whether Kashmiris were happy with that autonomy, what worked for them and what did not work for them is a separate question altogether. But the point is that they did have territorial sovereignty. Now, when we think about this territorial sovereignty, we like uh, uh, India presents it as if Indians were not able to uh, buy land and have right to franchise. But uh, we have to kind of suspend our uh, historical uh, times we have to go back to 1947 to thinking that this was a state in itself. These were people, this was a sovereignty. And that's how Kashmiris see themselves. When they see the territorial sovereignty clause, when Kashmiris saw that, for them, it was a, a protection for their country, just like India has its own laws. So it wasn't as if it was uh, a tyranny that Kashmiris were imposing on people outside. And it wasn't as if there were not laws enough uh, to allow Indians to work inside Kashmir, to allow Indians to have uh, property inside Kashmir. Of course, they didn't have right to franchise or right to hold jobs, but that didn't mean that there were not enough uh, jobs that Indians had, and also not the menial jobs, but the jobs where they were top administrators, because that's how the Indian administrative service works. And the autonomy which was imposed on Kashmir, and I like to think about it as imposition, the only thing that I think worked for Kashmiris was the territorial sovereignty part, because they were able to hold the territory together as much as they could, even though, again, that had been uh, diluted as well. Uh, because there was so much army inside that, uh, and there's so much, you know, if you were to put the army, how much area they hold together inside Kashmir, it's the size of Dallas. So that's a lot of area. Where are the Kashmiris? You know, it's a mountainous region. The land is already very, very scarce. In 2014, we saw how like a soup bowl Kashmir has become, even a little uh, flooding, even a little rainfall kind of uh, inundates the whole area. So that's a separate question, but the fact is going back to 2019, going back to autonomy, the whole autonomy did not work for Kashmir because by 2019, it was very nominal. Uh, everything that could be taken away from Kashmiris had already been taken. Uh, the only thing that remained was the territorial sovereignty where you didn't have, Indians didn't have right to franchise, right to property. Now, where does gender come in? Uh, and uh, so there were a number of arguments that India gave the rest of the world, not that the BJKP government wanted to give those arguments, but you know, you have to have something and you have to get those brownie points because they're also trying to sell themselves to the West in a, in a different format. But at the same time, they, they don't apologize as well. Uh, in that sense, they kind of, uh, uh, you know, Congress did things discreetly. Uh, 
they do it differently. Theirs is more spectacular, more militaristic, even though um, Congress also had a lot of direct violence imposed on Kashmiris. And it was during uh, the NDA rule and all of those uh, that, that most of the laws inside Kashmir were passed. Uh, that make it very um, that make it an authoritarian state at this moment, and and it was already a military occupation, which of course was camouflaged from 1947 onwards because you had client politicians inside Kashmir who were siding with India. And what were Kashmiris doing in those years? That's very important to ask. Like you know, sometimes. Uh, those years and kind of like this, the cosmetic silence of those years is translated as a silent and e and and a continuous and an increasing endorsement for India. But that's not what was happening inside Kashmiri minds, inside Kashmiri communities. In each decade, if you look at Kashmiri history, they have been waiting for the filibicide. They have been waiting for some sort of a resolution to happen. And that's very important. And that was nowhere to be seen. It's the critical Kashmir studies scholars now, and the ones who have written in vernacular languages, the ones who have kept on publishing and self-publishing inside Kashmir, and which was not read anywhere else. So that's why I'm saying we are a part of corrective amplifiers. We're not saying anything new that has not been said by our previous generations. The problem was that they did not say it a lot in English. They said it in Kashmiri, they said it in Urdu, they said it in local newspapers. So that has been going on in every decade, Kashmiris have been uh, protesting one way or the other. Uh, in the 1960s, there was an armed struggle. And of course, India likes to bring Pakistan's proxy inside. But you know, people need to pay attention to the fact like what was the relationship between people in Kashmir with what became Pakistan? You do not change those relationships overnight. You do not, uh, you, you do not get to decide who people will join uh, just because you know these colonial powers are telling you whether to be with India or with Pakistan. So I think those questions need to be raised and we need to add these are valid questions in a world that's looking at decolonial knowledge, that's decolonizing knowledge, why is it that Kashmiris have these two options and they have to adhere by those options just because Lord Mountbatten imposed it on the entire India and then Kashmiris had to comply? In that sense, Kashmiris have always been very resistant. They haven't really given up ever since Mughals uh, imposed and occupied them. So it's a lot, that's how Kashmiris draw the arc of the resistance and no one has heard those stories. What Indians get to hear is that this is a this is Pakistan's proxy war. No, this is not Pakistan's proxy war. Kashmiris love Pakistan. Kashmiris have a deep affective relationship with Pakistan, even if many of them want independence. There is a big section in Kashmir, uh, which is for accession to Pakistan. And that, of course, uh, and then there is also this, there's what India also likes to do is, uh, especially in its media and even its top brass uh, in the army. What they like to do is they like to tell the rest of the world, they misuse the word border. They uh, portray as if there's a border between what is Pakistan and Kashmir. But so, so far as Kashmir is concerned, there is no border. There is a line of control, which was a ceasefire line. And this is a line that breaks two Kashmiris, in, that breaks Kashmir into two. It was a ceasefire line. And Kash no one asked Kashmiris in 1971 that should we change it to line of control? It was not asked of Kashmiris. That ceasefire line is a historical line. It's the only line in the world which is uh, invisible from the space. That's the level of militarization. So Kashmiris don't see a border, even though there is so much violence of language, people call it a border because there's no other word. Uh, ceasefire line, you know, generations come and generations go. And I think that character has not been amplified. And what Indians are getting is a very nationalized, very jingoistic version of this U united India. But that is not true. That's not what Kashmiris see. And I think it's a disservice if someone is emphasizing and re-emphasizing this for them. And in that idiom, when you kind of are thinking about Kashmiris as deviants uh, that are trying to break up India, that I mean, Kashmiris are seeing as themselves as broken people. 
And then the other argument that India offers is that there is fragmentation inside Kashmir. Uh, there are many ethnicities, there are many languages, people want different things. There are collaborators who collaborate, who are client politicians and collaborate with India. Then there are people who side with Pakistan and then there are people who want independence. And then there are, you know, Ladakhis and Ladakhis. But the point is that India took more than 20 years to negotiate its own contours. It took more than 30 years of silent negotiations and conversations to finally decide what it wanted to be as a country. What are its contours? Who's going to join it? It wasn't the United India that it's trying to impose on people at this present moment in this point in history. It wasn't like that. So how is it that India's diversity becomes unity and Kashmir's diversity becomes fragmentation. So this is all the violence of language that we need to talk about. These are questions. So I don't see our generation as corrective amplifiers. I'm just throwing that word out there because I don't want to invisibilize the work that our people have already done. Uh, the work on who's, uh, on the basis of which our work is uh, standing. That's why I think that this is just amplification and it's a corrective. Uh, amplification of um, all the th lacunas that have been there. So, so, it, the, it, so Kashmiris have have believed this. They have lived these realities. You will see in Kashmiris there is an arc that happens, uh, and I'll finish in a moment, and I'll give the gender bit as well. The arc is that you will see there are Kashmiris who have been neutralized to the point they don't speak anymore. That's our our forefathers' generations. There are people who have started as out and out dissidents and activists in 1947, fighting India tooth and nail. But then when India brings in the Article 370, which is the autonomy, it also brings in its own laws, which slowly criminalizes uh, the Pulibicide movement, which criminalizes Kashmiri descent. And you will see those uncles and those aunts and those people who have been activists in 1947, kind of like dissipate and really, uh, you, you know, be shells of their former selves because they have been uh, in detention. They have been, and you know, when we talk about flee, a fleeing of Kashmiris, Kashmiri Muslims, they have uh, also fled. Kashmiri Pandits, of course, 1991, that's a very potent uh, time in Kashmir. Kashmiri Muslims from 1947 onwards have fled to the other side. And one of the things that I uh, probably did not uh, mention was this idea of uh, the line of control being shown as the border, and thus the other side of Kashmir made as if it's a, it's an anomaly uh, for other Kashmiris to kind of identify with and adhere to. There is a schism that has been created, a narrative schism between the two, as if they're different peoples. Uh, there's just a there's just there's just a river running through these people, and that that's something that we need to consider you know when militants when azad kashmiri militants used to die inside kashmir they're labeled as pakistani militants so that kind of violence has also happened and that nuance has not been talked about so when the deviance and this idea about pakistan's proxy kashmiris don't really buy that uh, of course there are nuances but uh, there is a definite, uh, there's def definite complexity here. And there is a lot of historical multi-layeredness uh, to Kashmir that cannot be seen in black and white as if this is a very Islamic fundamentalist kind of movement. Again, that's a stereotypical um, term that I'm using. So in 2019, what actually happened was there were n number of straw man arguments that BJP gave the rest of the world and also its own masses about why it was removing autonomy. One was terrorism, one was nepotism, as if that, uh, you know, is the lot of Kashmiris. And, you know, it's again kind of like a brown version of Manifest Destiny that they're going to go and set these Kashmiris right. One of the things that they use, the arguments, and uh, Junaid, I'll just speak for five more minutes and then I'll be done. One of the arguments they used was that it's a discriminatory to women, the Article 370. Uh, now let's think about that for a moment. What kind of discrimination is it doing apart from the fact that they wanted to show it as this really vehement patriarchy against its own women because that's very easy to buy. This is a Muslim community. And of course they are oppressive to their women. And now they have created this autonomy which these men are sitting upon. So the fact was that when Kashmiri women would get married to non-Kashmiris, uh, this, this rumor uh, kind of, this myth was started that they lose their uh, permanent residency, which was what the Kashmiris were. 
uh, that was a legal status of Kashmiris, almost like a citizenship to Kashmiris uh, within the autonomous, the quasi-autonomous system. So the government of India, in fact, Modi, when he was doing his campaign, he even picked the example of Umar Abdullah, who, who's a client politician, uh, belongs to one of the oldest parties. His sister is married to a Rajesh Pilot's son, Sachin Pilot. And he actually took, his, took her example and said that she has lost her a permanent residency. So the, it's because of the autonomy, women are losing their citizenship inside Kashmir. So we have to rem remove it. Uh, and then Umar Abdullah, who was the chief minister at that time, he went on record telling him that that's not, that's not the case. And, you know, I don't really adhere to their client politics, nor do I see anything from their vantage. Uh, but he did come out and clarify and say that autonomy is not an impediment. And in 2002, the High Court of Kashmir had already given uh, a judgment that they do not lose their permanent residency. But there was a slight snag, and the snag was that the property rights of the inheritors, the kids or the husband, uh, was not really clear. So the government early on had started this committee, which was thinking about it, and they were educating these on case by case basis, because there were not a lot of Kashmiri women getting married to outsiders. So it was not a pivotal or a central problem. It was a problem, and it should have been rectified. But governments and administrations, it's all red tape. So it took a long time for this education to happen. And I know personally of some of my friends uh, whose cases were taken up, they took a long time. So they had to, you know, grease some palms, talk to some people and get this settled. So of course, a law would have been better having some kind of a bill passed. And I think that was also in the works. But what BJP did was, it, uh, and also, you know, it's, uh, and of course, the people who gave it solidarity at that time, it was easy for them to buy the fact that, you know, women are discriminated against. It wasn't really understood what, what the issue was. And then there were two appeals filed, I think, in Supreme Court. There was one uh, person who was of Kashmiri ancestry, uh, hadn't really lived in Kashmir, and she talked about wanting a holiday home in Kashmir. Uh, and uh, she couldn't really trace, I, I think her generational ancestry, like the chronology was, is not clear to me, but it seemed like she'd never lived in Kashmir and they had left during the Afghan uh, regime, but maybe they held on to some property inside Kashmir. So it was a long, long uh, chronology that a history had. Uh, and she was, she was the one who was leading uh, that pill or the case. Um, I forget now uh, the exact details because there were two cases. One was uh, filed by a group and the other one was hers and they were in the su supreme court and they were fighting against the article th th 35a which was an accompanying article to the autonomy article 370 and that was to take the territorial sovereignty away to do away with the quasi autonomy because it was discriminatory to women but then Kashmiri women did ask the question and Kashmiri activists human rights defenders even the client politicians everyone went hoarse saying that they do not lose citizenship rights, uh, but the property rights are to be educated. Uh, but it was thought that it was okay to dismantle the entire state uh, to, and it wasn't just dismantled in a manner that the autonomy was taken away, it was bifurcated. Ladakh is a separate entity, a union territory, and now Kashmir is ruled uh, directly by New Delhi. So constitutional experts, they, they say that from a de, jure, de facto occupation, it became a de jure occupation on August 5, 2019. Of course, uh, the government of India doesn't want to believe that. And it's giving the narratives that it has since 1947. And from that, we don't really make any demarcations between the secular and the right wing governments or, uh, that uh, rule India. So that's kind of the gendered uh, discrimination angle that was used to dismantle an entire state and really take away uh, from Kashmiris what, what, was, uh, what was literally a little bit of protection to them as indigenous people and trying to protect their sovereign rights. Uh, and then there were other issues as well that were raised and those are separate. Uh, and then a little bit about the resistance. I think we should talk about that in uh, Q&A or maybe Junaid, we could, you could ask the questions. I'll stop talking now. It's more than uh, 20 minutes. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you so much, Athar, for uh, those wonderful remarks um, uh, and clearly laying out what is at stake uh, in Kashmir and what has happened since 2019, and especially what uh, you know, critical Kashmir scholars, uh, Kashmir journalists, 
um, and activists, you know, uh, people who have been like talking about Kashmir for a while, Kashmiris have been trying to do. Um, so maybe we'll spend another 10, 15 minutes talking. I'll, I'll ask a few questions, uh, some things that probably come out of what you've said, and then we'll open up the questions. I'm already seeing some Q uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, one of the things that um, I notice is that um, within India, it's not that there is a dearth of information uh, that people don't know what's happening in Kashmir. You know, that they can find. If they were looking for it, they would be able to find it. Um, I mean, and I'm not just talking about like the right-wing Indian um, people. I'm just I'm talking about the left liberal people who are generally quite reasonable on other issues. Um, but in case of Kashmir, uh, over the last 70 years, it seems that uh, there's a lot of almost effort put in to deflect the gaze, you know, as if like people are trying to not talk about it, not um, as if, um, I mean, I hear a lot of Indian people, like even friends who say, oh, I know what's happening in Kashmir. Um, and then they sh either shrug, their, shrug it off or say nothing is happening and be realistic. And then um, uh, on other issues, you know, on, on, on for instance, India's own um, anti-colonial movement uh, on its own sort of this post-colonial uh, consciousness that had evolved, um, they're quite um, sort of stringent and strident and, um, so I want to like know who probably you may have some kind of reflection on that. What is it that it would take um, India's otherwise reasonable left, otherwise quite liberal people to not deflect their gaze? Like Kashmir is not so far away. It's not like happening um, in Ukraine and it's not something that's happening in Palestine and or, or Tibet. They're much more, uh, they seem much more strident about Tibet and other places, but not Kashmir. Why is it? That's a that's a very big question, and it can be asked answered in n number of ways. Let me see how I can uh, think about this. So, one of the, the ways of solidarity that uh, we have received over the years, when we think about Kashmir uh, and ask for solidarity from you know global uh, community or even the indian community and people who have within india offered their solidarity to us there are there are many people who have but many times what happens is that the solidarity lasts only till we uh, decide to call it a human rights violation and the moment uh, we say no it's a political dispute uh, and there is you know people want independence people want to accede to india of course there are collaborators as well when it comes to that, suddenly the solidarity stops. It's almost like this shallow form of solidarity that is only with you uh, till you call it a human rights dispute, till the corrective is remove AFSPA and you know remove all the draconian laws and let democracy uh, reign kind of a thing. So I, I think that's, that's where the ahistorical piece begins. And that's where a deeply nationalistic bias uh, that is part of a post-colonial um, repertoire people have. And I think uh, as a decolonial uh, scholar or deco as, as part of the, uh, you know, uh, co contemporary scholars who are trying to decolonize knowledge, that's where we have to really see uh, how these countries have been put together. And then we've, asked, we've been asked to kind of adhere to them. Um, no matter, there are so many inflammations around what are the borders of India. So at that moment, when that kind of solidarity is offered and it only lasts till we say human rights violation and the moment we say, no, I uh, seek independence or I seek accession to Pakistan, then it doesn't uh, remain solidarity. It almost becomes an anti-solidarity kind of a thing. And that kind of sol shallow solidarity has been offered by many feminists who like to see uh, Kashmir as Kashmiri women. Uh, even during this time, uh, when uh, you know over the over the uh, over a period of last 33, 34 years since uh, there is, uh, so I, I don't want to say direct military aggression has been vis it's been more visible since uh, 1989, 
uh, but the direct military aggression and annexation happened way back 1947. So that, that so we have to kind of keep that in mind. What has happened has been a lot of gendered violence inside Kashmir. And that gendered violence is often presented as if it's a fallout of the Muslim patriarchy. Uh, that's a fallout of the Islamic extremism. With scant regard to the fact that uh, Kashmiri men are an emasculated patriarchy right now. And uh, because they are residing within this large military industrial occupation, and that is not just uh, feminizing them, but it's kind of like innervating them in so many ways. So Kashmiri women are dealing with uh, that, that kind of a situation in the moment. And that has been presented not as a part of a problem that military occupation is exacerbating, but that's presented as a problem as if it comes from the community itself, as if the community in itself is deviant. So I think uh, in the last 15 years, we have seen that kind of solidarity uh, being offered, uh, where we are friends and we are solidarity, we are in this part of, uh, we are part of a community fighting for the rights of Kashmiris, but only till the moment we say remove AFSPA, the moment we say this is a political dispute, resolve it as per the, either the resolution of the UN or the resolutions of justice to people who want to be uh, people, who want to be respected. Uh, so, so, you know, the moment that is said, all solidarity goes away. And and I think that's that. That's where, uh, I mean, I can't answer that for them, but I can answer for myself. And I can say that that is the moment where you realize uh, that you are a nationalist, you're a true out and out nationalist uh, and everything else looks like a deviance. Kashmiris, when they offer dissent, that's seen as a deviance. Kashmiris, when they say that what they want, they want uh, a resolution under plebiscite or whatever it is that you know the world community can offer Kashmiris, that's seen as an anomaly. Kashmiris, when they express their relationship with Pakistan, that's seen as terrorism. That's seen as a deviance. I think that's that's not a moment for Kashmiris to answer those questions. That's a moment for Indians to really reflect and see what their history is. I think. Part of that was, Junaid, you were also in that edited volume where you talk about Akhtar Mahideen, and I think he's a very important figure for all of us when I keep talking about the forefathers who spoke about Kashmir's history and tried to uh, provide a corrective. Um, Junaid has a piece in this edited volume that I and another colleague put together. It's called A Desolation Called Peace. And the reason that was put together was just to, and it's uh, published by HarperCollins India. And the reason that we chose to, uh, you know, go with an Indian publisher and have have these voices of Kashmiris from who were older or uh, kind of old from 1947 till 1989, giving their accounts, talking about their life and talking about their political consciousness uh, and how Kashmiris have never seen themselves as Indians. They have always waited for a resolution. Sometimes they have waited patiently and sometimes impatiently. And because they have always been an occupied people, they also have an inverse resistance where they kind of huddle and go into silence because that's, that's a survival mode. You can't really say that they have endorsed India. Um, so that uh, edited volume was specifically written for Indian audiences. Not that we can answer for them, but just to give them an idea. And as you say, Jana, there is a lot of information already in the Indian uh, media and people have written about it but the fact is are they willing to listen and for that they will have to kind of tide over the the, the their ideal of nationalism and how they see india um, not every dissent is breaking up india you also have to see it from the vantage of other people who have been broken to make india so kashmir is not undoing india uh, but what Kash India is doing to Kashmir is undoing India. So that that's a that that's so I don't know how I answered your question, but I think um, I I cannot answer for them. But what I can answer for is how I see it. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, uh, and this is uh, something that. Um, you know, when I was doing research in Kashmir too, um, and of course, you know, we have both lived in Kashmir for most most of our lives. Uh, one of the sentiment that I get from people is that they're not responsible for Indian conscience. Uh, and I, I think that's, uh, you know, it sometimes is uh, kind of frustrating to me when I go there because I feel like people need to speak more. 
but I also feel that um, it's, it's a sentiment I deeply respect. Uh, and I think uh, why I asked this question um, to you is because um, us, you know, we are part of the critical Kashmir uh, studies. We are, um, you know, trying to reach out to people around the world, including in India. And the responses we typically get are, um, um, are very strange, especially in India. I think outside of India, uh, people instinctively understand our situation. They kind of, it somehow resonates with many other things that they have seen around the world, the structures of oppression. Um, I mean, um, people in Palestine, um, um, people in, um, you know, Western Sahara, people in all other places, they recognize what is happening in Kashmir is precisely what's happening to them, uh, you know. Uh, but in India, we add, you know, and, and I'm not talking about the right-wing nationalists in India, which is, of course, the increasing majority now in India, but I'm talking about reasonable uh, people who would tell us, like we have been told, for instance, if you asked um, your rights within the ambit of the Indian constitution, things would be all right, we'll, you will find more solidarity. And then I'm like thinking, well, you clearly, your state does not respect its own constitution. Uh, it's be it betrays its own constitution. It uses majority in logic to try to destroy a uh, Kashmiri nation. Um, how do you expect Kashmiris to uh, respect that constitution? How do you ex uh, Kashmir uh, expect Kashmiris to uphold that constitution for you, uh, right? Uh, or we get um, questions like, well, you know, not, uh, you know, pity those Kashmiris, don't oppress them too much. Not all of them are terrorists. But this kind of uh, language has become sort of, um, um, a way, a sort of deflation of Indian consciousness. Uh, um, I mean, there have been commentators in the past who said that at some point this is going to come come back and haunt them. But and I'm still waiting for some kind of recognition um, or reckoning with by the Indian publics of the. The, the so the disaster that the occupation in Kashmir has been, have, not only for Kashmiris, which is of course, you know, we recognize that, we have seen that, we've experienced that, but also for uh, the post-colonial aspirations of um, people who were anti-colonial, who had expected uh, India to become um, a, a different kind of place, not the state it has become right now. Um, all right, so um, maybe if you could spend a few minutes talking about um, you know, the repression. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking about um, your, your, your inability to speak. You, you're forced uh, to not speak at a place like JNU. It's part of this larger process that has been happening. Um, I mean, could you speak a few minutes about like what has been happening with, for instance, the press freedom in Kashmir, mm -hmm. the tri tribulations of journalists in Kashmir and what has happened, what India has done to Kashmiri speaking on social media, etc. So I, I think, uh, I mean, we can go on talking about what's happening in Kashmir. I think the audience here, whoever is here, I'm hoping and I know that most of them will know what's happening inside Kashmir and the kind of uh, persecution of journalists and the persecution of human rights defenders, Fahad Shah, Kuram Parvez, uh, you know, I forget some of the other names, Asif. Uh, they're all in jail and they are being... Uh, charged under um, quote-unquote terrorism laws and which is really absurd to me that you know people journalists and activists who are demanding uh, just uh, peace to reign in, in Kashmir are being uh, persecuted in this manner uh, and but but I do want to ask you know when you uh, talk about uh, the the kind of uh, tone deaf attitude that is uh, you know, given to Kashmiris, I, I I think that's that that's the moment for me where I really want to ask, like, don't you know the history of Kashmir? I, I I think it's a moment. This is a very teachable moment for me. I still hope that there is some form of education that we can offer to people who are willing to listen. And I know there are people who are willing to listen, but mostly what people are doing is they're you taking the path of least resistance, uh, which is what we uh, see in these moments. I mean, Kashmiris have become the killable bodies. Like you can kill a Kashmiri and no one is going to ask questions. And that is happening to Kashmiri students all over India, not just the journalists. The journalists have become the canaries in the coal mine inside Kashmir. Uh, they are not able to speak. The most absurd 
of bills that has been passed. Uh, a Kashmiri journalist cannot report uh, from the scene of an incident where an encounter is taking place. They cannot uh, write till a bureaucrat kind of gives a go ahead. So that's the state of, I mean, I don't even have to talk about how many people are incarcerated at the moment just because they have written. That's all out for us to see amnesty and, you know, um, ICJ, everyone has talked about them. But the fact is that even a small, normal, mundane journalist who wants to write something, they have to get a state go ahead before they can uh, actually print something. And if they do uh, print something that's uh, that the state doesn't like, uh, they get a call the next day. And National Investigative Agency, I think Kashmir is because they use humor a lot. Uh, they're, they're kind of like, they, they, they talk to each other on phone and they talk about like, have you, if someone misses something in their home, they're like, let's talk about it on the phone and maybe the NIA will uh, come to our place and try to look for it because that's what they do. They come to people's home, they ransack the digital stuff and then they also take you away, arrest you and then question you for days on end. I think that has been a Kashmiri lot for the longest possible time. Uh, dissent has always been criminalized inside Kashmir. There was never any moment when Kashmiris were actually writing. Uh, that's why I'm saying that the forefathers and foremothers and you know people who have written before, uh, many of them have diaries that haven't been published or they have burnt them because that's what people did in the early 1990s because there were such brutal crackdowns. People were burning their photographs, people were burning anything that linked them to what could be seen as criminality. And that was also a picture with the Pakistani relatives that they had visited in 1970s. People did that kind of, and now what's also happening is that journalists work that has been published in the last 30 years, that's, uh, that's also uh, getting uh, deleted from internet. Uh, and, and that work is very critical because some journalists have done such critical work that becomes foundation of even what we speak, uh, that is, uh, that, that's, that, that, that's going away from the internet, that's being deleted. And they, some of them have written about it and some of them are not daring to write about it because uh, if they dare to write about it, they're going to get a visit from the National Investigative Agency and they're going to get arrested. And every day, every morning, we wake up to a news that someone has been persecuted, uh, someone has been put under revolving uh, the, the laws that they, the revolving door kind of persecutions. Uh, they get laid off on one charge and then go in on another. That's that's what's been happening for the past uh, 34 years specifically. So in that sense, we see media just as a canary in the coal mine. The other part of it is social media. Uh, other part of it is people, there's, there's committees inside government offices where, which are watching what their employees are writing. And if their employees, I think there was something a woman wrote about Bipin Ravitz. She got, uh, she got suspended. I don't know if she still got her job back. And you see teachers being suspended. You see people, just generally, I, I, this teacher, this particular teacher, she was suspended because she had uh, liked or she had just posted an emoticon, and that was the basis of her suspension. And I don't, I haven't followed it whether she got her job back. And the other side of it is incarceration of Kashmiris, not just uh, journalists and uh, humorized defenders like Parvez, Khuram Parvez or Fahad Shah. And, uh, um, you, you know, what's the what's his full name? I forget, Asif, Asif. Uh, Asif Sultan. Asif Sultan. And there are several others who, ha who are incarcerated at the moment and they have really become the face of uh, Kashmiri and it's not even dissent, they're doing what could be within the rights uh, in any kind of democracy. But that's where we have to really uh, contend with the history of Kashmir. And we have to understand that what, what prevailed inside Kashmir from 1947 was not really a democracy. It was all, always a settler state trying to camouflage politics of democracy through electoral system, through using the voting and the electoral democracy as a means to really uh, say that we are playing democracy. So they are actually using and weaponizing a democratic system to aid and propagate an Indian military occupation. And there's a question here um, about Pakistan occupied Kashmir. I don't use Pakistan occupied Kashmir, and this, this could be my opinion and you can challenge me. Uh, I don't use the word Pakistan occupied Kashmir because you have to understand it, the history of that moment. Now, 
the, these are the uh, this is the west side which actually fought for their independence uh, against the dogra monarchy they were not fighting fighting india initially they, because india was not yet formed in the uh, in the manner you see it now they were fighting the dogra monarchy and they were fighting for their own constitutional rights and forming some sort of a constitutional democracy and they actually liberated with help of whatever they actually liberated that side of the land and that's that's what i believe and that's what i have written about that that is a liberated kashmir uh, and that's what that, that's why they called it azad kashmir and that's why uh, i don't see it as pakistan occupied kashmir but it is a pakistan administered kashmir and you can use other vocabulary for it as well and when you use pakistan uh, Kash indian administered kashmir that's also correct indian occupied of course that visibly shows you what's happening inside and that's what has become very preferable and kashmiris are daring to use that uh, because they are not befooled by the weaponization of democracy anymore and the client politicians but you can't, uh, the Indian, Indian administered Kashmir, that also invokes a history. So if, if you are reading Indian administered Kashmir somewhere, that should make you go back to why is it administered? Why are these two sites called administered? Because they're both disputed and you cannot have elections in a disputed state. And that was what the United Nations said in 1951 when the first elections were being uh, decided and uh, you know when they were being planned at that time. But all of that history is gone Up till late 1960. You had Pilibicide administrators coming inside Kashmir trying to decide uh, when to have the Pilibicide, whatever the outcome of that would have been. So all of that history, you cannot invisibilize that history and pe tell people to shut up or uh, tell people that, you know, let's forget all about that. Now you have this Akhan Bharat and you have to join that. But then you also face other problems. You face this huge problem of anti-Islam that was really camouflaged. And when we go back to 1947, we see how big a hand RSS had in whatever was transpiring inside Kashmir at that moment. And no one had really been able to talk about that because, you know, you had other narratives that had uh, taken over. So unless and until people inside India are uh, really willing to contend with Kashmir's history, they will continue to see them as terrorists because it's the path of least resistance, but it's not going to serve anyone in the long run. It's going to really kill innocent people and people are going to take advantage of all the kinds of anti-Islam and, you know, anti-minority kind of rubrics and impose them on this. Unless and until you do not see it from the vantage of Kashmiris as they have seen it from 1947, I think it's a disservice to even talk about Kashmir and giving solidarity to it. All right, I think I'm glad you answered uh, that question. So um, I'm going to like go back and forth from the audience questions to my own questions. Um, but I think uh, based on where we are in, in terms of the conversation, uh, Simran has asked, what are some of the major puzzles that can be drawn between the Israeli colonization of Palestine and the Indian colonization of Kashmir? Can the resistance in Kashmir and Palestine draw from each other to increase the momentum of both moments, movements? Thank you for that question, Simran. Uh, in fact, there is a special issue in identities. I can send the link later on uh, to the organizers and they can uh, send that out. In fact, uh, uh, Junaid has a piece in that as well, talking about, uh, and we have uh, looked at Kashmir and uh, that's a special edit uh, edited issue in identities under power, power and something series. Uh, it's a special issue on Kashmir edited, co-edited with Goldie Asuri. Uh, who's at University of uh, Westminster, I, I think I forget the name of our university. It's a lot of forgetfulness today. But um, <clears throat> so we have talked about that and it gives you a nice, uh, and it has Palestinian scholars and Kashmiri scholars and there's more work coming. But how can we learn from each other? And what are the parallels? So there are lots of parallels, but I don't think that they are, they are kind of like similar struggles, but they're not same. And they're also the first two uh, first issues on the United Nations agenda. Uh, and that that kind of like also connects them. And maybe because they're both Muslim sites, that also connects them. But there are huge differences. Uh, and uh, so can what I see happening, I can speak for the Kashmiri vantage. I can't speak for the Palestinian vantage. Uh, I see the connection between the two as an affective uh, 
as an affective relationship between the two of them. It's an affective solidarity. Kashmiris have always uh, kind of seen a reflection of their own struggle in the struggle of Palestinian people. In fact, a friend of mine, and I've uh, written about this somewhere, uh, when she came to know about Kashmir, she said that, oh, it looks like Palestine that no one knows about. Um, in that sense, uh, there is a good, it's a good thing that we can uh, kind of uh, adhere to the fact that there are similarities but it's not same and we have to make sure that we talk about that as well. We don't want to collate or superimpose these struggles. The other thing that I also want to, uh, you know, a lot of people would talk about, uh, the, and I have written about this in the piece, uh, it's called Affective uh, Solidarity, uh, Our Wounds Are Their Wounds. That, that was one of the phrases that one of my interviewees said to me when I said um, about how do you see Palestinians and uh, they say our their wounds are our wounds, and that's the title of the uh, article. So, what Kashmir? It, it, there used to be this argument that Kashmir is not a settler colonial problem, and I think for the last fifteen years, critical Kashmir studies collective, uh, uh, sorry, critical Kashmir studies subdiscipline was trying to establish the fact that you know it might not look like your uh, daily settler colonialism but it is settler colonialism. And I think uh, that's also a parallel, but in a very different manner, because India has been out and out, seen as this large democracy, oh, yoga, ahimsa, Gandhi, Nehru, and that's kind of like helped it tied till this point in time. And in that, when you had the camouflage, the politics of democracy, the weaponization of democracy happening inside Kashmir, and you had client politicians to peddle that, you did not really see the settler colonialism happening in uh, from 1947 itself. And uh, you know, if you look at the Jammu massacre of 1947, you see the the, the how uh, Kashmiri Muslims from 64 percent they go to 40 percent in Jammu region. And that's not part of what is seen as the partition violence uh, in India. That's that's a completely different part. So when people say that there was there was largely peace when things were happening in India inside Kashmir, there was never any peace inside Kashmir in that manner. Maybe the Kashmir Valley was a little different, but again, uh, it was also a cosmetic peace. So from that moment onwards, as you kind of see that it has been a politics of democracy happening. That's that. That's why there were a lot of critics when we would talk about settler colonialism, we would get a lot of resistance to that, saying, no, it's not settler colonialism. But now after 2019, uh, it's proven that it is a settler colonial uh, process that's happening inside Kashmir. And that has happened for the last so many years. And if you see how many Kashmiri Muslims uh, from the Indian administered Kashmir have uh, been exiled, have, uh, have fled to Azad Kashmir. Uh, that's also another side of the story that has never been talked about. Uh, Kaberi Robinson's book, um, it has a long name, but uh, that's a very important book to kind of understand what's happening inside Azad Kashmir or what has happened. And that can also give you a good foundation to uh, what is currently happening uh, with uh, people from who have uh, fled from the Indian administered Kashmir and, uh, and also the refugees or the internally displaced people. Those people like to call themselves internally displaced and not refugees because they are very clear saying that there are no refugees within their own borders. You know, that's not the correct term. So they know their rights. They know how to talk in that idiom as well. Uh, but for that, you probably might have to read that book. Um, and also uh, going back to the question about the uh, you know, Azad Kashmir. I don't think I can speak for uh, the people there because I haven't done any uh, field work there. So what I can speak of is what I see from my own vantage and from my own uh, research about the historical facts. And that's what I'm laying before you. Um, all right, Atar. Uh, so I just want to um, kind of like, before I go into the audience question, um, uh, so recently, this new uh, Bollywood film um, has come out, which um, uh, many people have who have watched it, I haven't watched it uh, yet, um, who have argued that it's trying to kind of paint a, a one-sided picture of uh, what has happened to Kashmiri pundits. So now, uh, my question is not about the politics of this film per se, but uh, how Kashmiris respond to this. Uh, first of all, there has been 
uh, sort of this uh, suppression of Kashmiri voice. So there is literally no way for Kashmiris to respond, um, to talk about, uh, you know, their side of the story or um, their understanding of what happened in the 19, in 1990. Um, on the other hand, there is, of course, a lot of documented scholarly work that has been um, pushed aside by the makers of the film and, in general, the, um, the Indian right-wing narrative on uh, the Kashmiri pundits. Um, but uh, for me, as an anthropologist um, and as a Kashmiri, because we were there at that time, you know, I was there and I remember many things. I, our, our memories are kind of tied to those years. Um, and you know, speaking to people there uh, over the years, um, I feel that Kashmiris, Kashmiri Muslims, and you know the, the community uh, typically try to listen to uh, Kashmiri pundits a lot. You know, there's a there's a deeper sense where, despite the fact that the many Kashmiri pundits, especially who've kind of gone on to join the right wing uh, narrative. They remember the event in a in a way um, that, of course, many Kashmiri pundits, as well as Kashmiri Muslims, do not uh, remember it uh, that way. But there is also a desire to not speak back. I think maybe it comes from some kind of like a wish that at few there is a future where we, you know, the Kashmiri pundits could come back and we could live like neighbors again. You know, there's this ethic of neighborliness that at some point uh, one might have to even listen. Um, even though it, 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 it's falsification of history. Um, uh, but uh, more and more what we are seeing is this weaponization as you know, some of our Kashmiri Pandit scholars have called it uh, weaponization of Kashmiri Pandit mm -hmm. pain in pursuit of a, a political agenda that is seeking to further um, sort of not only demonize but uh, dispossess and disenfranchise Kashmiris to deny them uh, their sort of, um, you know, sense of belonging to Kashmir. Um, what do you think? I mean, what's happening now? Like, it seems like, I mean, I'm, and to be very honest, um, I get, uh, I have a deep sense of anxiety of like how um, these right-wing narratives are becoming so mainstream now in India um, and, and have been like, and globally as well, um, in a way that it bodes so bad for Kashmiris because um, the, these are weapons that are being used to for the demonize the population. That's close to ten million people. It's not a not a small number of people. You know, ten million people are being um, projected as somehow uh, being uh, having conspired to push Kashmiri pundits out. Uh so are you asking about the historical element or are you asking about? Uh... Um, I, I mean, I think this is perhaps not the moment to talk about the historical element. I mean, you're welcome to say a few words about it, but I just I want, feel like, wanted to I feel like when you talk about Kashmir, uh, it's, it, it kind of like when you talk about Kashmir, there is always like, there has to be a pause and there's been, look, <laughs> there is a history to this. <clears throat> so I do think that this present moment, it's a very sad moment. and. I mean, Kashmir is sad in and of itself, but it's becoming sadder because the narratives are completely hijacked in this moment. And there is no chance for nuance or complexity to exist. And that's what I see. Uh, and there is also a market, not just inside India, but also globally for a very uh, strident, one-sided kind of a narrative. Uh, because that's what the right wing government, like as as we are speaking, the film is, you know, there's also a danger uh, in speaking about the film as, and I don't mean to negate anyone's pain. And I, I seriously think about the time uh, historically uh, when there must have existed a Kashmiri mother whose one son was a Hindu and uh, not a Hindu at that time. That's not what they were called, a Saraswat Brahman, because they're mostly Brahmins. And then another would have been uh, a Muslim. You know, there would have existed such a time in Kashmir. I think Kashmiris, uh, we all need to kind of look at the historical arc from where we have begun. And no one needs to be apologetic for anything. No one needs to be apologetic for the fact 
that they chose Islam as an egalitarian system or the possibilities of an egalitarian system and what it promised them. And I think that kind of, uh, you know, it, uh, too much of history has been shoved under the carpet. As a result, what happens in 1991, that looks like uh, it, it didn't happen overnight. You know, a community just doesn't uh, disappear overnight because the mistrust has been created overnight. That doesn't happen. There's a history to that. Uh, and then there is, there's a history to that moment and that, that juncture. The other thing is, on one hand, uh, there is this I, narrative of exodus. And there is this, ex and then on the other hand, when you talk to majority of Muslims, uh, there is this uh, narrative of evacuation that they were evacuated. So there's like n number of, you know, anyone. It's almost like you know, anthropologically, when we speak about perception, you are looking at the same mountain, but you will describe it differently because your vantage is different. But then there is a singular truth in all of this that Kashmir is a political dispute, and everything that happens inside a political dispute happens within that ambit, and that uh, needs to be recognized. You cannot label Kashmiris as terrorists and say that they were uh, there was the, the so what what happens early on is that when the resistance starts there is also a political persecutions of people who are collaborating with india who are collaborators of uh, the regime at that moment and in that not just me but other school scholars have also talked about how religion becomes an overlap um, and how, uh, you know, th there are many Muslims and other uh, mi minorities who are at that time uh, siding with India who leave Kashmir and pundits also leave. So almost like, you know, going back to that point, well, again, we'll have to talk about a lot of history. But I think what happened in that moment is terribly tragic. But at the same time, it didn't really happen overnight. I don't really, I, I think we have for too long talked about Kashmiriyat, which again, uh, was an invention post 1947 to tell the rest of the world, you know, there's no uh, communal tension between pandit, uh, pandits and Kashmiri Muslims. I feel like they that history has not been talked about, like it was not a communal harmony, it was a communal truce between the two communities. One community was mostly and dominantly the political elite. They had the political elites. They had the educated class. Muslims were uh, mostly, almost all of them, except for a small clerical class, uh, they, were in the, they lived in indentured slavery. So what was also happening in the early 1990s was a class struggle. It wasn't just a, it wasn't just a political struggle, but there was this class element to it which also many dominant caste and uh, Muslims who sided with India and were collaborators of India and client politicians of India, they felt it very strongly. And I think what we kind of do is, there's not a Kashmiri Muslim and Kashmiri Pandit side to this. Uh, those are overlaps that happen when these assassinations to take place, when the persecution takes place. And then there are, you know, uh, there are bad elements who just take advantage of all of this. And there is also state orchestration. And then there is also other influences that you have, because it's not, uh, there's not only an indigenous a population that's involved in the resistance. But at the same time, you also have to understand that one of the most important organizations which had picked up arms in the early 1990s, uh, which had armed themselves, the J Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front, soon after this happened, they disarmed themselves and they returned to what they call a peaceful process to the consternation of the other side of JKLF, which, uh, which they uh, you know, uh, separated from. And the reason was that they could not take the fallouts. And that's my reading. People can read it in different manners, but they could not really take the fallout. The cost of communalization of Kashmiri movement was too big a price to pay. And I think Kashmiris, especially Kashmiri Muslims, and I'm not speaking for all of them, but some of them who have constantly spoken for this. And I have been part of those movements. I was also part of a movement, um, a community movement in the early, uh, in 2011, 12, 13, uh, which uh, Sayyid Ali Shagilani was also part of talking to the Kashmiri Pandit community in thinking about how do we move forward from this? And there have been so many of those uh, opportunities for Kashmiri Muslims and Pandits to come together where they have. And uh, it seemed for some time that there might be some modicum of success, but now the narrative has been hijacked by India, so to speak, and the collation and the weaponization of the Pandit pain uh, 
uh, into the geo body of Indian nationalism and ethno uh, fascist supremacist agenda. Uh, I, I, do, I don't see a ray of hope in that. And uh, you will, I mean, not, not, not just this particular movie, the propaganda against Kashmir has been going on in Bollywood for a long, long time from fetishization of the land and its women, uh, from fetishization, you know, Roja. Roja was like, you know, Kashmiris relished Roja in the 1990s. Uh, People used to watch it on, you know, VHS tapes and all of that, but no one was really paying attention to the fact like the demonization of Kashmiris that was done in that. That, that, the, that the, it was about a love story and people loved the love story. But the fact that the demonization of your father or your uncle that was being done in that, that wasn't really seen. So that's the violence that Kashmiris have gone through. Like there has been so much dilution of their own vocabulary, the violence of language and the violence that the politics of democracy has done on them. There's so many layers. And I think that's why this corrective amplification is needed. And I'm constantly, as I'm talking, even now, I have to constantly distill and clean my language and, and to just to make sure that it's somewhat correct. And it, does, it says what I want to say. I know there are limitations to language as such, but for Kashmiris, it becomes even more so because when you say LOC, it means that in 1971, uh, you, when most of us were not born, you were party to that agreement, which we were not. None of us were. Not our forefathers, foremothers, not us. And when you say... Uh, border, that means you're adhering to some sort of politics and you're kind of uh, agreeing to something that India and also Pakistan have done. But I don't think Kashmiris have been party to it. And that's 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 one of the things that uh, that we have to think about. How in a post-colonial world, when I, I don't really buy the post-coloniality part, let's talk about the how in a decolonial world, how in a moment of decolonizing knowledge, do we uh, talk to Kashmiris and do we kind of like listen to them? Um, and I'm not just saying Kashmiri Muslims, but also Kashmiri Pandits, because you know, most Kashmiri Pandits do side with India. Why do we shy away, away from that moment and from that opinion? Many of them did side with India. They were part of that uh, setup uh, along with the client uh, politicians who were also Muslims. So that those people had been carrying India, India's water inside Kashmir. So I think those histories need to be contended with and people have opinions, people have desires, they have desires as people. And I, I don't think uh, it, can be, uh, it can be as easily annihilated by just calling them all terrorists and all, calling them all Islamic fundamentalists, which is very easy to sell to the world at this moment. And I think, as I said, Janad, you know, it becomes longer, the answers become longer, I'm sorry, but because I, I don't think I have the luxury of giving shortcut answers. I, I think the burden of my generation of Kashmiris <clears throat> is longer historical answers so that our kids might have to answer less and hopefully not answer at all. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that, um, I think those of us um, who actually um, have not only gone through that moment, but have been able to reflect on that moment, um, are the ones who will have to sort of speak up more. Um, the, our children or the people who came after us, uh, they don't remember that moment or they, don't, they haven't seen that firsthand. Um, um, or the people before us who, whose voices, whose tongues had been cut by the Indian state, you know, who, who were denied the permission to narrate their own story, uh, who remain silent. Um, so it is our, our, our responsibility. I completely agree with you. Um, so I think we have time for just 10 more minutes and um, a couple of questions. So one is by an anonymous attendee. Given habeas corpus is often not observed in Kashmir and arrests go undocumented by the state, do we have a real sense of how many Kashmiris have been disappeared in Indian jails? So I don't have the uh, statistics. It's not only habeas corpus is abused everywhere in South Asia, not just Kashmir. In Kashmir, it's more exacerbated and it's a state policy, tacit state policy to uh, not uh, put it in practice. Um, so how many disappearances? I mean, we've gone hoarse saying that 10,000 plus disappearances, uh, not just in Indian jails, but also in, the invisible secret prisons inside Kashmir. 
And when we say prisons inside Kashmir, even homes are prisons. Uh, homes are converted into prisons and then they become homes again to people who really have to suffer in those. So not just uh, the human rights organizations like Jammu Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society, uh, the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons, which is partly uh, one faction works with the Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society, but another is still uh, fact, uh, is, is active under the co-founder Parveena Ahangar, who's mother of one of the disappeared uh, persons. Um, they have documented cases. And then um, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, all the uh, watchdogs, even United Nations uses these statistics that there are 10,000 plus disappearances. So I think it's time we kind of like, you know, just accept that number and uh, not have to say that over and over. There's also a pornography of violence that happens. I think we are tired saying how much human rights abuses happen inside Kashmir, not because I live in the privilege of West, but because uh, we've said it enough. We've written it enough. Uh, and I think it's time these statistics are accepted. And it's not only Kashmiris, you don't have to trust Kashmiris. There's also other people that you probably uh, want to trust and think are uh, worthy of trust uh, who have endorsed these numbers. So uh, how many in Indian jails every day or every, uh, every week you have new cases coming to light and uh, no one is really documenting them and ask me why. Uh, people are trying to document them, but in the last, since 2019, dissent, any kind of reporting of journalists, any kind of documentation by human rights organizations that's completely uh, been stanched. And one of the symbolics is the incarceration of Par uh, Kuram Parvez, who even during 2019, when things were kind of, you know, his organization was doing this kind of work and the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons under Parveena Ahangar, they were also doing the documentation. And, but uh, most, uh, you know, Parveena Ahangar was raided uh, and um, her office is under surveillance. Kuram Parvez is in jail and the office is completely under siege. So who documents this? Uh, there are other organizations, and I'm not saying these are the, these are the preeminent ones. There are other organizations who are trying to do some work, but how much work can you done when everything is criminalized? Uh, leaving home is criminalized. And now you also have the, you have the pandemic SOPs. Uh, every, every time uh, they have to kind of camouflage the state terrorism, they use the pandemic SO SOPs to stop people. Um, and from what I hear, uh, the way uh, not just the downtown, but also the uptown, quote unquote, which was seen as this, uh, the more modern side of Sirinagar and also um, the valley, uh, that's kind of woven with bunkers and uh, checkpoints and all of that. So, but there's no one to really uh, document anything. So, as I said, Kashmiris are huddling. They are in a huddle right now. And I don't think anyone should be uh, mistaking this for silence. This is silencing. They aren't silent. Uh, and knowing Kashmiris, there is going to be a fallout to this. How that is going to look like, we don't really know. Uh, so I, I think the statistics are all, uh, you know, they're established and I, I think we've all written about them. All right. Uh, so I think we have just uh, under five minutes. Um, I just want to ask you one last, last question um, um, before we end. Um, where are we going? Uh, you know, I mean, I know you're not Nostradamus who can predict things, but um, given the state of uh, what has happened to India and what's happening to India increasingly, um, in, in, in Kashmir, I feel like I have this uh, strange sense somehow that uh, where Kashmir is again being readied for some kind of a new assault. Uh, mm -hmm. all, the, all the things um, that were said, like Modi had announced in 2019, what was gonna happen in Kashmir. Um, it seems like, of course, you know, I mean, we have no trust in his words. Um, but not, none of that happened and not that it's, it seems like the Indian population which supported Modi uh, at that time with their rallies, support, you know, none, none of that. Um, they, it doesn't seem to matter to them what the state is doing to them. Uh, I, I get a deep sense somehow that in 
Indian majority is like somehow um, in the belief that whatever is happening in Kashmir is inevitable. Uh, somehow for Indian state to exist, Kashmiris have to suffer. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, where, where are we going with this now? I, I, th I think it, it might get worse before it gets better. And I think Kashmiris are also bracing up for something big that everyone keeps talking about. And they have a good sense of this, the intuition and a nose for all kinds of portentous elements. In 2019, I think they were predicting a year before that something was something big was in the offing with the kind of reinforcement happening with the kind of um, you, you know, the weaving of the entire city and also remote parts uh, with more troops, uh, they are uh, very, very scared. And um, I mean, we are also very scared for them. And considering that there is no one doing any reporting, there's no accountability, not even journalists can tell the rest of the world what's happening inside Kashmir in the manner it is. There is hardly any journalists in Kashmir. They're all so talented and they sacrificed so much for the last 30 years just to do the kind of reporting that is going to be just. Uh, and also in some ways, uh, uh, you know, keep their integrity as well as journalists and remain neutral. And they have done their job as per the ethics of journalism, but even they can't report it today. So we don't really know what's happening except for the, uh, the firsthand accounts that we get from the people that we are in touch with. So I, I don't know how this moment in Kashmir is going to be recorded because there's no one recording it. There is no one inside Kashmir who's allowed to write. Uh, the, the burden falls on people outside uh, to speak. And, uh, and I'm not saying that there aren't people who aren't sticking their necks out. There are people like that and they're sticking their necks out and the next day they're incarcerated. So that's the kind of rigmarole that has been set up. So where are we going? I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I, I also kind of like I'm alerting. And as you just said, that something big is going to happen. What that big is, we don't really know. But Kashmiris have seen the early 1990s when uh, Kashmir was sealed off and several massacres took place right after. They have seen those moments. They have seen 2019 when it was completely sealed off and no one really knew for the six months what was happening inside Kashmir. So they, there is that sense that there is no international entity is allowed inside Kashmir. Uh, there used to be some sort of a memorandum of uh, understanding with the ICRC, which has completely gone now. So no one really knows. And how can the world conscience kind of understand this, that there is a people who actually lived under the genocide alert in 2019, and no one really spoke for them. Uh, so. I, as I said, it might get worse before it gets better, but then I also have hope. I think the world is really waking up to understanding decoloniality, decolonizing knowledge, and there are people willing to understand uh, people's struggles against neoliberal post-colonial states who are also camouflaged and who also use ethno-nationalism and eth religious um, fanaticism as a camouflage. So, so it kind of works together. I think there is a lot of people really willing to understand uh, those struggles. It's going to be a long haul, it's a marathon, but that, that's where my hope lies. Uh, but I also know that in, in the immediate aftermath, Kashmiris at this moment are silenced and um, they're very prayerful people. They have not lost hope. You know, one of the things about Kashmiris was uh, that they, they didn't have arms uh, till 1987, briefly some arms in 1960. Um, and then they gave them up, like majority of Kashmiris, they gave them up as well in 1994. It just lasted four years. Uh, and I'm not saying that as a matter of uh, pride or as a matter of, you know, all kinds of resistance is equally important when people are uh, fighting for their survival. But I'm just kind of like uh, giving the larger sentiment that Kashmiris have. So what Kashmiris used to do was they used to leave home and they used to pray on the streets and they still do that. Uh, but they can't do that anymore in the last four or five years. Uh, one of the most preeminent mosques that is uh, masjids that has been, uh, that been the center of the resistance for the last 500 years, let's say, uh, that has, it was locked till very recently. They were saying that's the COVID guidelines, but people knew what the politics, uh, what politics was being played. So they're very prayerful people. Uh, they, they resort back to their mystical and uh, the forms of worship and prayer. And I, I know that, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be 
um, you know, hope and prayer that they are making, but at the same time, uh, they need some concrete political resolutions as well. And for that, um, you know, the world order or the world bodies, wherever, whoever they are, academics, activists, whatever kind of solidarity and coalitions can be formed. Uh, and I also think that save, it's not saving Kashmiris, it's also saving all peoples, because this, there, is, uh, there is a lot of uh, what the undoing in Kashmir is not just unraveling of Kashmiris or killing of Kashmiris, it has a big impact on what's happening unless and until that impact is not part of the grand design, um, which I think it is, sadly. So um, that's where I'll, I'll, I want to end on hope, but I also know that Kashmiris are preparing for something really worse, and I hope it doesn't come to that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you on um, the question of hope. I think many Kashmiris say we have seen a lot in history, um, and for them, history does not move in some kind of a linear fashion. It's not... Um, like the Indian majority Indian fantasies about Kashmir uh, are not going to sort of fractify for them. They they are, I, I, I mean, the word sabr is often used in Kashmir. I think that's what we've been taught since childhood. Um, on the other hand, I, I'm a little skeptical of the international community. You know, I remember in 2019, a week after Modi sort of put uh, 10 million Kashmiris under military siege, um, he was invited by the Indian diaspora to the U.S. where in this Howdy Modi event, mm -hmm. they screamed and laughed and so, as if like he had conquered Kashmir for them. Um, but now I'm seeing, you know, with this whole Ukraine um, sort of question, um, many governments are asked, talking about the rights of people, right of self-determination, you know, uh, right of the uh, smaller countries not to be invaded and occupied by bigger countries. So um, while this is, I mean, there's a hypocritical side to some of this, but uh, I think it might re uh, rejuvenate some of the discussion about, uh, and return us, return the world to some kind of a, 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 a sort of a moral template. So, mm -hmm. well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Athar, for your wonderful comments today. Um, I just want to thank you. I also want to uh, thank uh, organizers, um, especially Lotika Singha and uh, Shruti Bala and uh, Divya Natkarni, who has been uh, behind the scenes helping us uh, set all of this up. And I want to also thank Insaf India and all of our audience who has been here today. Thank you so much. Have a good thank day. you, everyone. Thank you to the organizers and the attendees and uh, hope that we create more solidarity. Thank you. Have a blessed day and night wherever you are. <laughs>